For more than a decade, uh, the Centre for Independent Studies has identified the practical measures that will enable Indigenous communities to improve their economic outcomes. Our researchers have built the evidence base so that clear assessments can be made of what government and private programs are working and what isn't working. As almost always is the case in these debates, the issue comes down to funding and service delivery. Now perhaps no one in our federal parliament is better able to address these and related issues than our guest today. Uh, Ken White is the Federal Minister for Aged Care and Indigenous Health. He's the Federal Member for Hasluck in Western Australia, has been since 2010. And Ken is the first Indigenous Australian to serve as a Minister in a Federal Government. And I learnt a few moments ago from Ken uh, that, and I reckon he's the only Member of Parliament to have had this pleasure, Ken met Sir Robert Menzies back in 1964. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Ken White. Tom, thank you very much. And to the Centre for Independent Studies, thank you for giving me the time to be with you. In West Australian Yungar language, I say Kaya Wanju. Hello and welcome. At the same time, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Today, I want to pose the question, what is the currency of positive change for the health of First Nations people? Is it government or private investment? Is it determination or is it personal motivation? To begin, I'd like to thank I'd like those of us who can remember to think back to 1972. Australian Helen Reddy was topping the international charts and we were getting out of Vietnam. At that time I was a young fellow who was growing up after uh, spending time in a country town, coming to Perth occasionally, being the oldest of ten, having the responsibility of guiding brothers and sisters on a journey uh, that was very different to my own. The 10 Embassy went up at Parliament House in Canberra on Australia Day that year, a symbolic foreign mission erected in the fight for land rights after years of dashed hopes, an embassy that continues today in the fight for equality. In 1972, it was a potentially life-changing year for thousands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. Prime Minister Gough Whitlam established the Commonwealth Department of Aboriginal Affairs, ushering an era of bold new promise, building on changes implemented by previous governments following the 1967 referendum. Looking back in so many different ways <laughs> since then, we have come far. Yet in 1972, we have not seen the broad, uh, since 1972, we have not seen the broad wholesale changes that we would expect especially given the significant funding and the vast amount of good intention that has been invested in Aboriginal affairs. Yes, for the first time in several years, we are on track to reach three of the seven closing the gap targets. But what, li what lies behind the statistics that still highlight the health inequalities today? What have we got right and wrong since 1972? As I travel our nation, I see and hear more inspiring stories of First Peoples' achievements and the journey to equality from almost every corner of our country. Perhaps I'm a bit old-fashioned, but I like to call these jewels in the crown because they shine so brightly and they exemplify the things that work. One of these is a university college for Aboriginal students I recently launched in Perth. Now doubling in size six years after it began, boasts a 90% retention rate with almost 80% of students passing all their exams. What an incredible contrast to when I was working in education in the 70s and early 80s. Head to remote communities in the Kimberley and the Pilbara and you'll find the E.ON program, literally teaching children how to grow vegetables and good health. This is especially close to my heart because I approved the initial modest funding to help start the project 10 years ago. 
Since then, EON's employed scores of local Aboriginal people, worked with students and families to create hundreds of school vegetable gardens and has run counselor <coughs> cooking classes, including bush tucker too. The compelling taste and health benefits of homegrown food are one thing, but it's the ownership. The healthy habits are skills learned and the pride that they are also helping change young lives. The EONS program, now in high demand, is extending further south into WA and into the Northern Territory this year. In the Western Desert, the Pinabu Laracha people saw the tragedy of kidney failure and decided it wasn't going to be a one-way ticket off their beloved country to being hooked up to dialysis in Alice Springs. They took control, famously painted and sold precious artworks and raised a million dollars to start realising their dream. 18 years on, the Purple House Project has treatment centres across the vast lands, a mobile dialysis truck, and just as important, a growing primary and preventive healthcare network. Not surprisingly, the wraparound approach from the ground and street up most often shows the common denominator of success. This local impetus is being strongly supported and replicated with careful community consultation through significant Turnbull government programs. Better Start to Life and its care and family partnership began a child's health journey before conception. We have funded 124 sites nationwide and still counting. The results are showing fewer low birth weight babies, higher rates of breastfeeding and in our Australian Nurse Family Partnership Program sites, 100% immunisation rates, the highest in the nation. At the same time, from Alice Springs to Port Augusta, from Dumaji to Canberra, the Connected Beginnings program links parents, health and care and education so children are ready to start school, learn and grow into healthy teenagers and adults. As Nelson Mandela rightly said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. But sometimes I go into communities and I meet with organisations that tell me they are meeting their health targets the key performance indicators. I then get permission from elders to walk around and chat with locals. In one particular community, I met a significant Aboriginal artist. We were walking along and a friend was talking to this particular painter, painter and I noticed her eyes, so I asked, how much can you see? She said, I can't see very well, much at all. I'm hoping for my cataract surgery. At the time, it had been a two-year wait, yet the health organisation's KPIs were being met. How could this be? In a country as rich and adv advanced as Australia, how can this happen? This is not an isolated incident. Improving overall Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health is first and foremost critical for the well-being and dignity of hundreds of thousands of first Australians. But it is also fundamental to our nation's commitment to equality and our global health status. The health of First Nations Australians is everyone's business. We must continually celebrate with Aboriginal communities and families the many milestones in health, education, careers and cultural achievement. At the same time, it's crucial we look carefully to where the poorer aspects of health and wellbeing remain. In these cases, doing more of the same is an option we can no longer afford. The high cost in lives and lost futures is incalculable and budgets are also under intense pressure. First Nations knowledge is embedded in the memories of the living, knowledge that is imparted through teaching, storytelling, music, art and dance. They are our living libraries and losing each individual means a precious book of knowledge is lost forever. It is imperative that we enable people to be healthier and to live longer. For far too long in Aboriginal health, there was a piecemeal approach, series upon series of programs, often with inadequate accountability. Every time there's been a new issue or challenge, people say we need more money. Currently, there are two evaluations underway to identify opportunities to improve access to quality and effective primary health care services, assess health gains and identify the social returns and the broader economic benefits of the Indigenous Australians Health Program. While government investment in the program will continue to grow over the Ford estimates, it is imperative, especially for these in greatest need, that we maximise the health value in every dollar. 
To illustrate this point, I want to look at the current challenges of sexually transmitted infections and blood-borne viruses. Recently, I was asked to approve significant special funding for a targeted program to tackle the increasing prevalence of STIs, particularly the alarming rise of syphilis in northern areas. When I asked what are the states and territories doing about this, I was dis uh, disturbed to find too little had been invested and too little done after the first warning signs appeared almost seven years ago. Certainly not the extent I would have expected from responsible jurisdictions. There was still an overwhelming reliance on Commonwealth leadership and funding in order to address the spread of STIs across the top end. Ensuring awareness and respect for First Nations people and cultures throughout our health system may be critical to a quality of access. But above all, there is a fundamental human right that we must accord every one of our citizens and that is the right to good health. Picture this scenario. A doctor based in Kintor, around 2,000 kil kilometres southwest of Darwin, visited the community of Kirikura, located in the Western Australia's Sandhill country, the beautiful Gibson Desert. This doctor reports meeting a group of nine nomadic Aboriginal people, and he says, they were the most healthy people I have ever seen. They were literally glowing with health not an ounce of superfluous fat. They were extremely fit. The year was 1984. Today we hear a different narrative far too often. There is an alarming rise in obesity and diabetes, suicide levels are high, and there is alcohol and drug misuse and the impacts of poverty leave many people with a sense of powerlessness. Too often, First Nations people's achievements are overshadowed by health and welfare stories of deep and understandable concern. We're seeing laudable improvements because of interventions, but they're not always consistent enough and they're not often not equivalent to the results achieved by other sectors within multicultural Australia. I'm strongly focused on where we need to improve. On why? Even after accounting for the social and environment, for environmental impacts on health. We are seeing substantial improvements because of interventions, but they're not always consistent enough, and they're often not equivalent to the results that are achieved within mainstream Australia. I am strongly focused on what needs to improve and where we need to improve, on why and even after accounting for the social and environmental determinants in respect to the variation of communities across our geographic diversity, it becomes challenging. For almost 20 years now, the Medicare benefit schedule has included an item number 715, a health assessment especially designed to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people receive primary care matched to their needs. A, 17, a 715 looks at a patient's health, physical, psychological and their social well-being. Yet only 217,000 people in 2016-17 have been assessed under the MBS item 715. At the same time, I see organisations such as the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health that according to their 2016-17 annual report, have over 33,000 active patients, of which approximately 60% have had their 715 health check. <laughs> In 2016-17, the organisation's members network of 19 Aboriginal community controlled healthcare clinics generated more than 14.3 million in Medicare income. With all the funds reinvested in the delivery of comprehensive health care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in South East Queensland. What I see here are significantly better results through the completion of a cycle of care comprising the range of chronic disease and other MBS items. The Institute has grown its clinics from five to 19 over the past nine years, with their 20th soon to open in the Moreton Bay region. I'm excited by this work, the innovation and capacity to change and the resolve not to accept the status quo of poorer health outcomes. I look at some of the health disparities and think, why aren't we as a nation case managing fundamentally 720,000 people in a way that would make a difference to so many chronic conditions? I've asked my department for an overhaul of the 715s. What I want to see is all First Nations people accessing all relevant MBS items in the same way as other Australians do. 
A key government focus is on health for our children from conception right through to their late teens so they can grow into strong and healthy men and women who can, do the be who can be the best mentors for their own children. With more than 1,700 first Australians receiving kidney dialysis and, and rheumatic heart disease affecting another 6,000, and they're mainly young people, this year I decided I would prioritise renal health and RHD along with eye and he ear health. From four national roundtables, we're now charting Australia's first roadmaps to coordinate efforts to combat these debilita debilitating and deadly conditions. It's absolutely intolerable that RHD among our First Nations people is happening at 50 times the rate of that than any other group in Australian society. In parts of the Northern Territory, those horrific rates of RHD are doubled again. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people under the age of 55 are starting dialysis at twice the rate of non-Aboriginal Australians, with many showing danger signs in their teens. The unfinished business of today is disappointing because we should have been celebrating more successes. And there are community controlled health organisations and other community groups established to service great need, setting down enough and asking families and individuals what they know, what they want and what they think would work. But they must ask, where is the continuity of service for anyone who requires an intervention to prolong their life or to circumvent illness? Minor ailments like skin sores or strep throats, if treated consistently and effectively, won't develop into an early onset renal failure or rheumatic heart disease. In the same way, neither will ear infections become impaired hearing that can stunt a child's learning capacity and their chances of a good job or any job at all. There is a need for a holistic approach to the health of each individual. Some of the benefits flowing from Australia's recent mining boom have been great employment opportunities close to country for thousands of First Nations people. But the job hopes of many were hampered by deafness contra contracted in childhood, much to the frustration of mining companies committed to hiring local staff. Hearing and communication are fundamental to fulfilling our life's potential. There are also two of the most valuable commodities for sustainable change in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. Governments and non-governments organisations across the board must listen and hear the voices of families, of mothers, of fathers and community elders. Not just the voices of those who are the strongest advocates for the establishment of a organisation or a service that theoretically should make a difference on the ground. And I say this with no political overtones. The Prime Minister and the Turnbull Government are committed to doing things with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and not to them. Last year we led a massive group listening program. The My, Le My Life, My Lead consultations involved 600 people at 13 forums across Australia, plus more than 100 written submissions were received. Seven priority areas were identified from the grassroots up and are informing the current Closing the Gap Refresh agenda. The priorities we heard from first Australians across this nation were putting culture at the centre of change, success and well-being for health through employment, foundations for a healthy life, addressing environmental health, healthy living and strong communities, improved health service access and health and opportunity through education. We need to be fully committed to sitting down and listening, hearing what's actually being said and continuing to invest in programs that do their work from the ground up. Policies and services that reflect local voices and wisdom are more closely owned by the people they serve. People are empowered because they've been heard and take responsibility because they're respected and proud. Around the nation there are many things that are working and I have seen programs and services where Aboriginal organisations, Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people are highly successful in the most difficult of circumstances. I saw June Oscar and her community's work in Fitzroy Crossing which has changed the whole dynamic of buying alcohol and curbed the local tragedy of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Together, they turn the town around and now you see strong families there, bound by the glue of loving and care. 
Alcohol and bad behaviour of a few no longer defines Fitzroy Crossing. The strength and the story of the community does. When I think about the successes as well as the failures, I know that responsible parents and families provide the most consistent and enduring interventions. Funding for health programs and services from public or private sources will only ever be part of the currency for change. By far the greatest value for change will come from every mother, father, uncle, aunt and elder every day, taking responsibility for and contributing to better health but enabled by the organisations that exist within their communities. For over 65,000 years, the First Nations people survived and thrived without a plethora of organisations. Individual families and communities pulled together to ensure the health and well-being of all. Working and walking together with local people, families and communities, we collectively need to declare non-negotiable standards to be met from the bottom up. Standards that also reflect the pride of the oldest continuous culture on the planet. This individual responsibility extends far beyond families to health and community groups and organisations too. Everyone working to close the gap in health equality must look at themselves and say, together we have outcomes to achieve. What difference are we really making today and how can we do it better? We must consistently walk around the communities we serve and look for patterns of disparity in order to address them. If that's what we're seeing, the question should be, are we fighting for our own people? Are we listening enough? Fortunately for the future, increasing numbers of young First Nations people are hearing the call to lead the next wave of change. With more than 40% of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population aged under 24, large groups like the undergraduates I met recently at the University College are set to make a significant impact across many fields that may help close the gap. <coughs> Excuse me. Through concerted programs around the country, there is also a growing number of First Nations health professionals at all levels, such as doctors and nurses, in allied health, administration and management, in policy, planning and research. My message to them and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in communities across this nation is that we are proud descendants of those who came here at least 65,000 years ago. We have proven incredible resilience and will continue that tradition of resilience and respect for our country and for all Australians. But the strength of our cultural identity will always remain the basis for our health and what we strive for and live for. I certainly call on all individuals working in the health sector to make the health of First Nations people everybody's business because the contribution that 720,000 First Nations people can make to this nation is in so many fields of endeavour. And we see that frequently from the people that we see aspire to leadership. I look at the work of people like Pat Dodson, Mick Dodson. I look at Adrian Carson, who's with us in this room, who took a model of innovation and decided and dared to be different. Leaders within our communities who dare to be different are making a difference. But equally, in my own journey, my journey wasn't formed only by my parents. It was formed by the friendships of those who wanted to provide the support and guidance to help me take a journey that was important. My year one teacher, Miss Abernethy, who I focused on in one of my speeches, taught me every word that I use today. When I came from a place called Nanine, my speech wasn't all that brilliant. And she taught me the meaning of language, the power of words, the use of those words to be effective in debates and in discussions, and to champion for the causes that are important. Through to the business people that I've walked with, and more recently, people across this nation who I've acquired knowledge from in order to do the work that I do. And I look at my Aboriginal brothers and sisters across this nation who've also been part of that journey. And I don't believe that anything is impossible for us now in Aboriginal health. <coughs> I want to finish with this uh, comment. 
that renal disease has been a challenge. And when I talked to a nephrologist, I said, how does a kidney work? And he said, we all are born with 1.5 million nephrons, which are little filters in each kidney. He said, but an Aboriginal baby born underweight has only 65% of those 1.5 million nephrons. And on that basis, they will be behind the eight ball. And every infection, every disease that they have, blood sugar levels, obesity, will show them, will have them showing indicators of end stage kidney disease at the age of 19. So collectively, there is much that we have to do. There is much that we've achieved. And I want to celebrate the achievements of success, not the gaps. So thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Now it's time for um, Q&A. And our first question comes from Josephine Cashman, who's uh, a Warramay entrepreneur for New South Wales. And she's also authored several reports for the Centre for Independent Studies, most recently, Impact Investing, Harnessing Capital Markets to Solve Societal Problems. Josephine. Uh, thank you, Minister. That that was was thank you, Minister. That was an inspiring uh, talk and it's so good to um, look at success rather than failure and build on that. I was just going to ask you, as um, the Minister for Indigenous Health and Aged Care, what are the, what are the three things that you're most proud of in terms of the work you've been doing in these areas? I think one of the proudest achievements for all of us is the establishment of com community controlled health services, Redfern in 1972, and then the growth across this nation. Because up until then, the access of Aboriginal people to primary health care was not brilliant. Uh, the health system then was not as supportive. But those changes have meant that we've had advocates uh, who've pushed for change. My other achievement, I suppose, that I celebrate more than anything else is my two sons, giving them a healthy life and a journey in life and an attitude that they can do anything. Uh, but in Aboriginal health, it's probably becoming the minister and having the opportunity to work with some of our key leadership to target the simplest of infections, which is otitis media or glue ear. The mining companies I spoke to in the Pilbara said to me they couldn't employ young Aboriginal people on their sites because their hearing was impaired because their eardrums had thickened from chronic suppurative otitis media and the holes they had in their eardrums. So there's a whole workforce that couldn't be employed and engaged. So it's those things that I want to tackle and that's ultimately the goal that I want to work towards. But if I had a pinnacle moment, it was acquiring 1.5 billion through the COAG process for Aboriginal health in the station and having it matched by states and territories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Melina Morrison, Business Council of Cooperatives and Mutuals. You've spoken passionately today about the importance of community ownership and the many grassroots bottom-up models that you described, including the wonderful health service that came up with a solution in Fitzroy Crossing to fetal um, alcohol syndrome. I wonder, Minister, if you're aware of a tragedy that might be unwittingly unfolding due to the funding guidelines of one of the flagship um, federal government programs, the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, which currently requires cooperatives, Indigenous cooperatives, of, when of which there are more than 200 are operating in Australia, in health, in housing, in many areas of human services, uh, community controlled. In fact, the many of the health services you described started as cooperatives and still are today. They're required because of the funding guidelines of the Indigenous Ad Advancement Strategy to incorporate under federal um, regimes, since many of those cooperatives are still registered at state and territory levels to change their corporate <coughs> structure to a federally regulated corporation. And what that's doing, the tragedy is that that's the structure of the solution, which is the holistic, democratic, grassroots model, is potentially being un undone. And I've just become aware that, in fact, the Ninda, Ninda Lingari, um, forgive my pronunciation, cultural health service that came up with that fetal alcohol syndrome strategy in Fitzroy, Fitzroy Crossing was a cooperative and is now um, a corporation. And yet under its 
cooperative structure, it was required to have the same levels of corporate um, <coughs> governance and director duties. So I wonder, Minister, if you could um, tell me what the federal government might be able to do. At the time that change occurred, it, it arose out of having consistency across all organisations that were in receipt of Commonwealth funding because there were a whole range of arrangements and there were some bodies that weren't incorporated. And the Commonwealth uh, looked at where people were incorporated. <coughs> Excuse me, because we still have a lot of Aboriginal uh, bodies incorporated under state and territory legislation. But that particular program wanted consistency and the consistency was through the ORIC uh, arrangements of uh, ensuring that the incorporation occurred. Because it gives the body then the capacity to receive the Commonwealth funding. And we fund out of a number of programs across every government agency to organisations who are incorporated under that process, but we also fund those that are still registered and incorporated under state. So it'll depend on the program, but the intent is to ensure that they receive funding in order to continue the programs that are important within those communities. And Nina Lingari's work has been critical, but they do other work in terms of reaching across uh, into areas that you don't measure within a community. And that's the social impact you have by the nature of the work that you do and the way in which you engage. But if they're in strife, then we certainly look at those when people come to us. And I have this frequently where an organisation will say that they've reached their limitation and is their capacity within our budgets to help them grow. And often we consider those and we do fund many under the Commonwealth Incorporated Program, but also those under state. Uh, Minister, th <coughs> thanks for y your speech and um, it's great to fo focus on the things that are working um, and, and, and yeah, the, the, the successful programs. <coughs> the thing that bothers me is that you put all those together and we're still not closing you know, some of the most important gaps. So particularly in your area, the, uh, the gap in longevity has pretty much stayed the same, I think around about yeah. ten, 10 years. <coughs> and that's obviously got to do with, with health health outcomes. In fact, I think those gaps are worse than they appear because quite a number of Indigenous people are mainstream and presumably getting mainstream results and so the disadvantaged Indigenous people are probably getting much worse outcomes than, for example, that 10 year gap. Um, but the point, I and you mentioned <coughs> um, alcohol and drugs and you mentioned uh, Fitzroy Crossing and what June Oscar did there. Uh, it seems to me that alcohol and drugs and even gambling have a major adverse effect on health outcomes and outcomes generally for Indigenous people. And so I'm, I'm just wondering whether there shouldn't be more focus on what to do about those because it's hard to <coughs> just rely on the Fitzroy Crossings and the Halls Creek uh, communities to, to do their thing. Most of the other communities don't. And, um, and the government has been trialling the cashless debit card, mm. the so-called cashless debit card, uh, I, th I think there could be a much greater role for that and I'd be interested in your comment. I think one of our greatest challenges is poverty and access to services. When I, from the communities I've been involved with over my lifetime, and I'm now 65, most Aboriginal people don't drink. And But where you do see drinking, it is those who drink publicly and the imagery, <coughs> like Tennant Creek or other locations, is very marked. But then I talk to people within that community, uh, and it, I'm not talking Tennant Creek, but others, where they say the bulk of the time we don't. What we want is better opportunities to accessing health services that consider us. Now, life expectancy is a challenge when we're having children born with low birth weight. The moment you're born with low birth weight, to some extent, you're going to be behind the eight ball. Um, and then you consider a journey, and I had the round tables unpackage this. Start the journey from in utero, and if the child is not healthy in utero, then you can anticipate that the odds are stacked against them to living a long life equivalent to that of another Australian. Then you have simple diseases like crusted on scabies. Now you don't expect to see in Australia crusted on scabies on a child. 
blood <coughs> sorry, high blood sugar levels, nor the impact of uh, fatty foods starting to harden arteries. Obesity is becoming much more common. And so when you look at the combination of all of those, we're never going to achieve the same parity with other Australians. What we will see a closure of the gap is if other Australians coming through allow those same health impacts to have a detrimental effect on them, that their life is reduced. And evidence is showing that we will close the gap if that scenario for mainstream Australian occurs, but that should not be the way of achieving it. By going back to a healthy uh, embryo in utero and a healthy child that is born and in the first 17 years of life looked after, then there is a better opportunity of pushing life expectancy right out. But we've also got to couple in with that all of the social determinants because poor housing is challenging in the, the mix of social uh, impact on health. And so it's much more complex than talking about a disease. And I made a comment at a, an event here the other day, we should stop talking about body parts. We should talk about a whole body and how we treat a whole body. We run programs. I spend something like 73 million on Aboriginal high health. I then spend an equivalent amount just on ear health. And then we have other body parts that we fund. And the reason I mentioned Adrian Carson's program is they take a whole of person approach and they deal with the individual and then wrap services around them. And community controlled health services talk about a holistic approach because what they're trying to do is wrap services around to push out life expectancy. But the challenge is, is and I'll use myself as an example, I could be taken to a doctor but not necessarily open up about the health condition I have. Or I may choose not to engage in accessing primary health care. And I, as a typical male, would push that out until a point at which I'm hospitalised and then suddenly discover that I have a sinister illness that will result in an early death. So there is also an expectation that I need to do something as well, and that's some of the conversations I want to have at the community level that you also have got to participate in the programs that your organisations are delivering. And that mothers, and in New South Wales, we developed a program called the Maternal Child Health Program, in which we had a midwife and an Aboriginal health worker working with mothers in communities across 17 sites in New South Wales. What we got out of that was all the mothers, Aboriginal mothers turned up for every session, for the whole period of the pregnancy. Unintended consequence, halfway through the third semester, uh, trimester, their partners joined them and stayed with them for the whole time. The other element of that was the birth weights were normal, healthy kids. But the thing that I didn't expect was that the Aboriginal health workers asked if they could go on to become Aboriginal midwives. I'll become midwives, not Aboriginal midwives, midwives. And when I left New South Wales, there were 23 who were training to become midwives at UNSW. And I know they've graduated and New South Wales has increased its numbers. So you've got health professionals now at the community level engaging in a real way, sitting in the dirt and sitting on the ground or in homes talking to people and giving them the reasons why uh, the maternal child health programs are absolutely critical. Yeah, so one of our... Uh, <coughs> Policy analyst in business affairs here at CIS is our next speaker, uh, Charles Jacobs. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, for 10 years now, we've had the notion of the gap as our main means of measuring progress for Indigenous people. I've thought about this a lot this year when we had the 10th anniversary in the report. Um, do you think that the notion of the gap might be a bit outdated as a terms of measurement? And by that, I mean that we measure our improvement relative to the Australian population. So as that population's outcome changes, that changes the size of the gap, it's constantly fluctuating. And I think that makes it hard for program providers and uh, services to strategize over perhaps a five, 10 year period. Whilst it's ide idealistically <coughs> the goal to close the gap, would not be better to have hard targets. We still need our targets. If we don't have targets, we won't strive to achieve. But I do what we did with the Neeland strategy, the National Indigenous English Literacy and Numeracy Strategy. We shifted from talking about the gap. What we did for the measures in literacy and numeracy 
is we said, how many children have achieved the standard this year? If it was 60%, then I worked with, and I was working for WA Education. I worked with Catholic Ed and the Independent Schools Association and said, if the result is 60, do you reckon we can achieve 65 by the end of next year? And that's what we did. We started to build on achievements and celebrate success. When you continually talk of a deficit, you create a mindset that nothing is ever going to really change the deficit. And talking about closing the gap <coughs> is something I'd prefer not to. I would rather talk about, I don't mind if we have the strategy of closing the gap, but I'd rather the conversation switched around to let's celebrate what we've achieved and continue to achieve that. But by setting goals, you force systems and jurisdictions and the Commonwealth to work to strive to achieve those targets. We do it in the corporate sector. Uh, we do it in our own personal lives. And so it doesn't hurt to set a bar that we want people to achieve. Because the thing that I dislike is when we take the lowest common denominator between all of you and say, let's just work to this level. When one jurisdiction could achieve that. And a challenge I gave every principal in that period was I said, if you took two Aboriginal kids in your high schools or in your schools each year and you build on that number and you just work through making sure two of these kids were highly successful and at the peak of their opportunity and op, uh, capability, by the end of 10 years of schooling, you'd end up with uh, 20 extra kids who would have finished high school as opposed to your high school not having any children finishing. Because the retention rates when I first started to work in Aboriginal education in WAs, you'd have 980 would start in primary school. By the time you got the end of year 10, you were lucky to have 10. And then the numbers became bigger, but the results even worse. But by turning that discussion around, we started to achieve better numbers. And in education, we're now seeing levels of attainment that we've never had before, but we're seeing job outcomes being better for those who gain qualifications. So we've had some and I look at Anthony with his qualifications. Um, he and I could have made a decision not to proceed and not have our aspirations. And we would never have made it to where we are now. And what's important is that the role modelling that we exhibit, our mob are cruel on each other. Um, people who make it to the top, we give them hell. Uh, derogatory. Uh, we call them coconuts. We say you're just like white fellas. But in fact, we're not. What we're showing is our potential and our capability of standing as an equal beside any Australian. When I stood in the parliament, I made the comment in my speech, I stand as an equal with the members in this chamber because I got in the same way. And I know that each Aboriginal uh, person in this room in Torres Strait Islander has done exactly that. They have stood as an equal amongst their peers. And that is a better way of having the standards but achieving the targets. One, one final question. <coughs> Minister uh, Richard Beattie, we've heard a lot today that's been very positive that frankly I haven't been reading in the newspapers and I'm imagining a lot of people in this room uh, won't have heard that so many positive things are being developed at the moment. However, I would like to say that sustainability is one thing that is essential for all of us in every different environment. And it goes without saying that the remote communities cannot be self-sustaining without ongoing government support. Now, if I've got it right, there's something like 70 to 80 percent of Aboriginal people are living in urban and regional and rural areas rather than where the worst of the health outcomes you've been talking about today exist. So what I'm suggesting is that should there be a change from having not 70 to 80 percent, but all of those and preferably everybody at risk in the remote communities be put in the same situation as the vast majority of Aboriginal people. And to achieve this, if 
remote area funding was replaced with a refugee type program and people in family groups in unsustainable communities moved to urban regional areas with long-term intensive assistance to become self-sustaining like the majority of Aboriginal people could be a long-term solution to what so far has been insoluble. Let me answer it this way. One time I might have thought that, but I spent 12 days in Israel. And I went to areas of Israel that were desert. And parallel to that desert, and the UAE is the same, absolute sand. And I saw where innovation in leadership turned a desert region or the desert sands of UAE into Dubai or into kibbutzes that were generating uh, the food that's required in Israel. And part of a comment I made many years ago, why is it that 100 non-Indigenous people living 50 k's away from an Aboriginal community with the same number thrives and the other doesn't? And I said to uh, the department I worked in at the time, we've got to rethink the use of land and the opportunity, but also the skilling. Because we've got to think about the 65,000 years I referred to where people survived in some of the most arid conditions. The last of the people that came out of the, the Gibson Desert were the Kirikura people. They only came out because we'd had those five seasons of drought that impacted on the desert and their country regions had gone. But I still see tremendous potential in many of our communities. It's the way in which we change the mindset of welfare dependency. When CDEP was first established by the Commonwealth, the intent of CDEP <coughs> was to work for the dole but to tr skill people to make their communities become self-sufficient. And I'm now seeing in a couple of territory communities where local people have established a bakery and they're providing the bread for the community. Utopia, which if ever you go out to Utopia and have a look, people have combined contemporary and traditional life. They're healthier than Aboriginal people living in capital cities. And yet when you look at the photographs, you think their health would have to be deplorable. But Monash University uh, undertook work with the community and clearly showed uh, that their sedentary lifestyle had been altered by the fact that they had a combination of both. I think governments have got to look at the reality of where and when. Commonwealth policies in the um, uh, 70s uh, and later in the 80s created homeland movements in areas uh, that were traditional to people but had not been lived there. They were part of the navigation of country that was theirs. But some families wanted to move out from a community and create a sub-community by being out of problems in a community. <coughs> the Commonwealth at the time were funding them. So in one sense, we've created the problem, both Commonwealth and state and territory governments. And we didn't continue with a program like CDEP that could have been rebadged as a skilling program in order to create sustainable communities. Because the land, when you look at Waluna, Waluna community decided to grow um, citrus fruits they grew rock melons and watermelons. They were superb. They had forward markets to Harvey Fresh for the, all of their citrus fruit. And they had forward markets for their rock melons and um, watermelons. But a dispute between three families saw the destruction of that enterprise. And it sees somebody ring barked all the trees. And because of that, an enterprise went down. So there is capacity, it's just we've got to look at what opportunities there are. But I would certainly encourage kids in those communities to ground their future in a solid education. As Nelson Mandela said, education is the engine for reform, where the daughter of a farmer can become a GP or the son of a peasant can become the president of a great nation. So education is critical, so is skilling and the imparting of skills. So thank you. CIS is an agent of change and these leadership lunches are very important for us. No, not least when we have someone of the vision and clarity of Ken Wyatt, someone who knows the power of 
words and knows how to drive that into change. Ken, you spoke about uh, the currency of change and you spoke about how money is not the only currency of change, how its focus on outcomes, on patterns, uh, on ideas um, and on, on leadership, which clearly from what you've been telling us you have plenty of. And it's what drives CIS. This is an organisation of ideas and the work that we've been doing here on Indigenous affairs over maybe 15, 20 years, starting with Helen Hughes's landmark work, Land of Shame, looking at how a wonderful uh, first world country has not done a very good job with its First Nations people. And I think, Ken, it's great people like you leading some of this change that will make a difference. How you talk about celebrating successes, not just the gap, and trying to make uh, real change in how this is done. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us here for not just an inspiring address, but for what you are doing for this country. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Minister. And thank you for being here today. We hope to see you again. Thank you.